preached in this message. Hungry Hearts is a non-denominational church which is Torah observant and spirit filled. We believe that Yeshua Messiah died to pay for the sins of all mankind and having accepted his sacrifice for sin, we live by all God's laws and commandments. We're filled with his spirit and we worship him with it. Today we're going to talk about Yeshua Messiah died the second death. Amen. We're coming into Passover and it's time to take that take things seriously with regard to the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua Messiah. Before I get into today's message, I want to offer you Pursuit Magazine. It's a free magazine. It comes out quarterly. It's got great articles written by fabulous writers on great Bible topics. Everything is in-depth and thorough. This comes out quarterly. If you'll email me at hungryhearts, M-I-N, at AOL.com, I will mail you this magazine for free every quarter. We never use your address to solicit funds. We don't sell the ad, the mailing list to anybody. The only thing we use this mailing list for is to mail you this magazine and to invite you to a service if we happen to be in your area. There's been a lot of controversy over whether Yeshua Messiah was killed on a cross or on a tree. And a number of Bible writers are very specific, but we're missing the point. They're not specific as to regard as to the device on which Yeshua was killed. They're specific as to a point in the law which explains the greater power and meaning of his death. So some people have taken this and have tried to make a federal case out of he was not killed on a Roman cross, but almost all of the archaeological evidence and the Bible evidence itself points to the fact that he most likely was killed on that pagan symbol. Now for those of you that don't understand, the cross has been a pagan symbol since the beginning of paganism. It is found in every culture, Babylon, Egypt, Hindu, all of them, they all use the cross. So this was an added insult to kill the creator of mankind on a pagan symbol. Nonetheless, that isn't the point the Bible writers are trying to make. So we're going to go to Romans chapter 2 because the Bible writers are using the typical, the word tree to designate for you what Jesus did. So we're looking at this man dying on a cross, and we're thinking the death that is appointed unto man wants to die. Hey, we're all going to die, amen? Now, look, there's a rescue coming. Some among us are not going to die. Oh, well, some of y'all want it, that's fine, but I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to avoid it if I can. So Romans chapter 2, seems like the more time goes on, more and more people are losing faith in the rescue. But we're not going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what Jesus did for us. Amen. He died something far more profound than the death of your relatives when you've gone to the funeral home. Far more profound. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. All who sin apart from the law will perish. So people tell me, Pastor Bill, I'm not under the law. Well, if you sin, you're going to perish. I, I, I hate to tell you that, but that's, that's what the passage here says. So if you sin apart from the law, you will perish apart from the law. I don't know about you, but I don't want to perish. If it's all the same, or even if it's not all the same, I'd like to not perish. Now then it says, those who are under the law will be judged by the law. Well, I don't know. It's, I'd rather be judged than perish. Amen. I mean, you people don't want to be under the law. That's your business. But I don't want to perish. And the Bible clearly says, if you're, if you're not under law, you are going to perish. Mashiach is in the Torah. Nomos, the word for law here, means the first five books of your Bible, the law of Moses. Mashiach and mercy is in the Torah. Man, please, I, I'd rather be judged under Torah than perish without. Amen. Maybe some people want to perish, but I'm not one of them. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight. It is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. This is not crimos for the criminal law. This is nomos for the law of God. So we find little things. Look, we found some other stuff here in the last couple of weeks. You know, you read stuff over. It's amazing how we are so trained to read the Bible in light of a particular outcome. So we read it, and the more we read it, the more we reinforce the outcome which we were told we were supposed to have. And then one day, some blinders come off, and it's like, hey, that's not what these words actually say. Maybe it means what it actually says instead of what I was told it says. But this process is a lifelong one, because we've been told a lot of things about the Bible, 
a lot of which are not true. So even when you come into the, the truth and the churches that teach, quote, the truth, then you still find stuff in the Torah they told you you didn't have to keep. And then you find out, yeah, you really do. They were mistaken. Well, I, I'm being generous. Uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> As it is written, <clears throat> there is no one that is righteous, no, not one. Oh, well. Wow. He's not cutting you any slack, is he? There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. Oh, but pastor, I've been seeking, I've been doing something. No one. That's everybody. You got no excuse. You tarred with this brush. You're not getting out of it. You thar. As we say to South, you thar. All have turned away. They have together, together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Oh, that's good preaching. Awful quiet. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full, are full of cursing and bitterness. Somebody's driven in, Jackson. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm not joking. Oh, never mind. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. Zip! No one's got anything to say. Because we all are sinners. You've know, got people who don't want to make sin lists sometimes. Are you blind? Did you read this? You're included. No, not one. That means you. Got a sin list. Got to get right. You know, you don't have to get... You don't have to write People ask me, do I have to, Pastor? No, you don't have to. You can keep them if you want. You don't have to get rid of them. And when we get done with this study, you'll know why you want to get rid of them. You don't have to. You don't have to let Jesus pay for your sins. You can pay the price yourself. You don't have to get rid of them. But the price is death in the lake of fire. So, yeah, ouch, ouch. I don't want that. <clears throat> Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Why? Because you already broke it. It's too late for that. See, that's the whole point of the whole exercise. You already broke God's law. And you know, he knew this beforehand. Yeshua was crucified before the foundation of the world. He had already volunteered to die this death. He had already volunteered to die the second death in your place because they designed this whole thing so that you would sin. Why? Because the power is in you admitting you're wrong and turning back to God. The whole power is in you getting involved in a sin knowing full well you weren't supposed to, having to come to Yeshua Messiah and ask for forgiveness, turn around and go sin no more. It is about We talked about overcoming last time, right? Old time overcoming. When you overcome a sin, you have power over it. You have the mastery over it. You can pray for others. But if I pray for you or someone else prays for you and you get delivered, you don't have mastery. You got delivered because you failed. But when you overcome... That's when you are empowered. To, to the overcomers get the rewards, right? How many times do you have to say it? To the overcomers, they get this. To the overcomers, they get that. To the overcomers. So it's not a matter of never sinning, because the Bible's already said we've all sinned. And he lists a bunch of them there. We're going to find out as we go through this study how there's no way out of not sinning in the first place. It's all about, he's right, I'm wrong, and I'll get over it. Or as you go through the process enough, he's right, I'm wrong, and I'm healed. He's right, I'm wrong, I'm healed. I, it ain't a problem anymore. It ain't a problem anymore for me to say, he's right, and I'm wrong. He's right, and I'm wrong. He's right, and I'm wrong. Someone said to me, ah, oh, you're always making me wrong. Okay. You read Romans 2. I mean, Romans 3, you're always wrong, right? Throat's an open grave. Mouth is a sepulcher, you know, a burial chamber. Ruin and misery mark our ways, right? And we're blind because we can't even see it when we do it. We have to ask for repent. Oh, come on, that's another whole message. We're not going to go there. So this was the state of humanity before Yeshua lived a perfect life. So he lived a perfect life. He experienced all the stuff you did, but he uh, he didn't he didn't he didn't fail. He's the only one of us who will ever be able to say, "I lived your life and I did not fail." That's why all judgment's been given to him. That's why we've got to learn to kneel at the feet of Yeshua Messiah. 
There's a reason why all judgment's been given to him, and that's because he lived one of our lives and he didn't fail. Amen? Now, I'm not going to go there, but it says that the Son of God was made perfect in suffering. But holy, he was God before he was made man. So how could God, be, who is perfect, be made more perfect through suffering? It's simple. He overcame. He lived our life and he overcame. So a component to his life that could not exist before he was human, he has. Oh, come on. This is good preaching. So church people like to focus on nice. Nice is great as long as you're living righteous. Nice is great when you're keeping Torah. If you're not keeping Torah, or if you let nice become the enemy of right, well, come on, parents. Sometimes you want to cover up for your kids. You can't cover up for your kids. They, they, they did it. They're hanging out there. Just leave them alone. Oh, you did it. You did it, man. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not coming to your rescue. you got to get right with you. No, 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 we done. As we're going to show in here, Jesus is not always nice. Sometimes he says some hard things to people. He's not always nice. Perfection was not about nice. It was about right. It was about keeping those laws and commandments. Even those who had the law did not live up to it. So we now are all under the curse of the law because we broke it. Hey, come on as a kid. I cut grass every Saturday. I cut grass every Saturday. Every one of us has broken the Sabbath at some point in our life because we weren't raised in it. Every one of us has used a five-finger discount. It's real quiet now. Every one of us has told stories to keep from getting a beating. Either you had some real candy cane parents, because I didn't have those. I'd say, I'd say whatever it took. Y'all just don't understand. I would have said whatever it took. I mean, you learn to get good at it, too, because the old man can tell. He's a car salesman. He, you know, you know, <laughs> first rule of the car business, you can't believe your own lies. So you can see through a lot of them. I mean, you've got to be good. Some of y'all, one of y'all got that. Two of y'all got that. Blink. <clears throat> don't blink. No, no, don't, don't blink. <laughs> All right, let's talk about this, this tree. First Peter, chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to go through about four, uh, three or four verses where they, they talk about a tree. Because I want you to see this. A lot of people make a federal case out of this, and I understand why they do it. Uh, they don't want the pagan symbol associated with our, our beloved uh, uh, Messiah, but it's impossible to get away from that. <clears throat> They, and in one reason I'm going to tell you that you know it was a cross cross is because they put a sign over his head and you got to stick it on something. It don't just hang in the air by itself. <clears throat> but First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. On the tree. You see that, right? Tree. T-R-E-E. -E. All right. Acts chapter 5. On the tree. And look, I, I've heard great sermons on why this was a tree and not a cross. They were mistaken, but they, they were sincere, right? I'm not trying to bemean anybody for it, but they were trying to get away from it. They kept going back to the tree. But I'm going to show you the importance of the tree in just a minute. It's going to confirm tree. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. Hang him on a tree. Acts chapter 10. Verse 39. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. Now we know it's a cross, so why do these guys keep bringing this up to tree? There's a reason for this. There's a reason in God's law why they're associating his death on a Roman cross with hanging on a tree. And it's very important, and it underscores and it explains to us all these thousands of years later the kind of death and the death itself that Jesus died in our place. Amen? He did not die the death appointed in a man once to die, because that would not have saved you from the lake of fire. All right. Verse 40. <clears throat> but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. So he was raised from this death. He was raised from this death. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So he was killed on a tree, and he was raised to life. This is important. Now see, you're hearing this because you have a westernized, sundified, sorry, 
Sundayfied way of looking at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're not looking at it the way they're looking at it. Because even though we are a Torah observant church, even though many of us have done this for most of our saved life, or in my case, all of my saved life, Lenisa, I've been in this 34 years. Lenisa, I mean, the Sandy's very close to 30 years, right? Is it 30 years? 30. I mean, you're right. Yeah, she, she's right behind us. So we've been doing this a long time. But even so, we read over this, and we don't really take it in in the gravity with which they're saying it. Because to the audience that they're speaking to, they understand a component to this just by virtue of the fact they said you killed him on a tree and God raised him to life. And we're like, we've seen this movie a million times. Ran every Easter in our childhood. You see him hanging on the cross, then you see him coming out of the tomb, right? No big deal. Modern life. But there's an important component to dying on a tree that we don't get because we've generalized it too far. We've generalized it too far. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, and I'm going to show you from the law the importance of this. And we're still not going to get it. We're going to read this over. But again, it's like a lot of other scriptures. You read them over with your own preconceived ideas. You don't read them under with the gravity of the way they're looking at this. Right? The way they're looking at this. So it makes what the leaders of the Jewish people did to Yeshua all the more wicked. It makes his resurrection all the more powerful. And it makes what he's doing for you radically more powerful than, what, than the way we typically just think about it. Deuteronomy 21, in the law, verse 22, If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death, and his body is hung on a tree, his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him the same day, because anyone who is hung under a tree is under God's curse. The, uh, 22 and 23. So here's what we miss. When they killed you by stoning, it was generally understood you could get a drop to your knees and repent for your sins and be in the resurrection. When they hung you on a tree, you died and will never be resurrected. You're under the curse. They didn't understand lake of fire. That was something that they were going to euphemistically uh, apply later in, in, their, in their thinking, but it's not canonized in their part of the scripture. The lake of fire is in the book of Revelation. So they're not, they're not going to get the understanding of this concept. But the bottom line remains, when they hung you on a tree, you are not going to be resurrected. You are gone. You are not coming back. You are not going to be. They understood that eternal judgment part of you're hung on a tree. You are cursed from God. See, we didn't get it. That you kill him by hanging him on a tree. You killed him in a way that made him accursed of God. Why does that matter to us? Because we all broke the law. We all broke Torah. How many of you had, had uh, pig in your earlier life? Well, if you're from the south, of course you had pig. That's all we ate here, right? How many of you had shellfish at one point in your life? See? How many of you worked on Saturday? Oh, we worked on Saturday. How many of you kept Sunday? That's a sin too, right? Hmm. How many of you kept Christmas? We're in. We're in, right? We're under the curse of the law because we didn't do what he said to do. He said, don't do everything the pagans do. So what do we do? We, we took Christmas and we made it Christian. But it wasn't Christian. It's a pagan celebration. For $12, I'll mail you this, by the way. You can uh, send this. You can buy it on PayPal on HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com. We'll send it right to you. And this is Ancient Roman Celebrations and Their Adaptation by Early Christianity. Great book by Evangelist Kelly Mack, and it will prove to you that you don't need to be keeping Christmas, and we hope to see you in Sukkot. All righty. So we're proving what's going on. So, 
I want to go to John chapter 19, and let's just see what was going on to Yeshua Messiah. <clears throat> because what they did to him was, was crazy. And you know what? We can blame other people, but if we were them, we'd have done the same thing. It had to be. Right? You have to understand it had to be. All right? Why does it have to be? Look around. You want to be in this, right? Then they had to reject him. If they didn't reject him, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be. Because if first century Jewish people in the Holy Land had accepted Yeshua as Messiah, only those Jewish people would have been saved, and that would have been game over for everybody else. But praise God, he had already decided they would reject him so that he could save all the rest of Israel. And they're going to get grafted back in. So be nice to those people. You know, you know how they used to say it back in the day, be, be careful who you step on on the way up the corporate ladder because those are going to be the same faces you see on the way back down. So be nice to the Jewish people. You're going to see a lot more of them in the kingdom of God. Amen? Better to have friends. All right, John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Actually, the Greek word is scourged. They scourged him. They beat the flesh off his bones. They tried to beat him and debilitate him so that he would die quickly on the cross. <clears throat> the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put a purple robe on him and went up to him again and again saying, Hey, O king of the Jews, they struck him in the face. One version, I mean, one of the gospels says they spit in his face. Once more, Pilate came out and said, Look, I'm bringing him out. Here's the man. And Pilate really hoped that after scourging him, that, that would have gotten the crowd to go away. That would be enough. They'd be happy because he's probably going to die of the scourging anyway. When he came out wearing the purple uh, robe and the crown of thorns, Pilate said, here's the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. They wanted him crucified. Why did they want him crucified? They wanted him hung on a tree. Watch this. Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find, no, I find no basis for a charge against this man. He's done nothing wrong. And the Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, the penalty for blasphemy was stoning, not crucifixion. Take him out and stone him. If you remember, Jesus told him twice, I am. He used the I am, and they wanted to stone him for saying it. See, we read over it, all he just said he was. The I am is a specific name of God, and it's the one that God gave to Moses. Tell the people that I am sent you. When Jesus says I am, they said you're calling yourself God, and they went to stone him twice. So the, the penalty for blasphemy was stoning, not crucifixion. Why did they want him crucified? Because they understand that if they understood that they could hang him on a tree... He's going to die a curse from God. They didn't just want him dead. They wanted him a curse from God forever. Oh, that's bad. That's bad. It's not even according to Torah, and it's just bad. That's why they kept bringing up tree. Because they wanted to show that Yeshua died cursed from God. Let's go to Galatians. I'm going to go to a passage of Scripture that a lot of Sabbath keepers don't like because it's misconstrued. But... Because of the first day people, we tend to look at all of these verses in their terms. We've got to bring these back to the Torah observant terms in which this thing was given. Because this was not, passage was not given to do away with law keeping. This passage was to show you that you've already sinned, therefore your law keeping can't get it done. You need faith in Yeshua Messiah. Then... After you have faith in Yeshua Messiah, and you take his sacrifice for sin, then you can keep Torah. And so, a lot of the first day people want to accuse us of trying to earn our salvation. When the opposite is true. Because, you see, they're the ones that say you can't play cards, you can't dance, you've got to cut your hair a certain way, you've got to wear your hair a certain length, you can't wear pants, you've got to wear... See, they come up with all these rules, and they're, they're rigid on those rules. We're not teaching you any rules. We're telling you to accept Yeshua for your sins. You already broke Torah. You already broke it. It's too late to talk about righteousness from Torah. But once you accept Yeshua, now you have an obligation to live under Torah because he's paying the price. You don't get to do what you want anymore. You can't pay your own price. He paid your price. All right, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. 
You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Yeshua Messiah was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? By believing what you heard, right? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? See, you're never going to be able to live the law good enough to get into the kingdom of God. Let's just face it. Look how well it's gone for you since atonement, right? Not real good, huh? I already were thinking about that sin list, right? I hope you are. I'm already thinking about mine. We need to be. Oh, come on, you guys. You drive in Jackson. Who are you kidding? You drive in Jackson. Who are you kidding? I know you've got a sin list. I'm kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> <clears throat> have you suffered so much for nothing if it really was for nothing does God give you a spirit and work miracles among you because you observed the law or because you believe what you heard it's because we believe what we heard the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not come from Torah this doesn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes from your faith in Yeshua Messiah however if you sin enough by breaking Torah by breaking Torah you can lose the baptism of the Holy Spirit sin can put you out Verse 6, consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on the law are under a curse. The key word there is rely. The key word is not whether or not you're going to do your best to keep the law. It's whether you're relying on it. Because you can't rely on your law keeping. Just look at that sin list where you put it in there. If you need to look at it again real quick, you sneak off in the corner and kind of open it up. And look at it. Oh. You can't rely on that. You can't rely on that. That's not going to get it done. Trust me. As much as I know and as much as I strive, I don't want to rely on my law keeping to go anywhere. Man. Whew. Talk about getting warm. You won't have you won't have to worry about getting cold. I can assure you that. Cursed is all who rely on observing the law under curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. We just found some new things. Go talk about them next potluck. Some new things, but we didn't do them. <laughs> Oops. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. That's a quote, by the way. I think it's from Hosea. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, I'm sorry, it's a, that's a back quote. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. So you have to live by that law in order to be justified before God by the law. Wow, you see our problem already. It's, getting, it's going to get bigger before it gets better. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He became the curse. The reason the gospel writers are telling you he was hung on a tree is so that you could understand that he became the curse for you. He took your curse. If you let him. If you let him, you can hold on to it. I think I'll keep it. I want to keep my curse. I like my curse. My curse is good. I'll just hold on to it right here. You don't have to write this sin list. You can hold your curse. You can hold on to it. I want it. Or you can put it in the fire and let him have it. I don't think I want that. I think I'll let go of it. Tough stuff happens to me already, right? Maybe some of y'all just really lucky. <clears throat> the promise of Messiah, the Holy Spirit, redemption from sin, all these come from the belief that Yeshua is the Messiah. And that he died for your transgressions of Torah. Now in verse 13. Oh, I read it already. The whole point of tying the crucifixion to the tree is to demonstrate to you from Torah that Yeshua Messiah took the curse of the law. He took away the wrath of God for all of those who will believe on him in faith. That would you like your, to keep your share of the wrath of God? No, no. Romans chapter 1. See, we don't want to talk about the wrath of God in America. We don't like it. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. 
The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Do you not see this going on every day in the news? The wickedness, the wickedness, the wrath of God is coming for all this stuff. Oh, but we don't like to talk about the wrath of God in America. And the way we live in this country, I guess not. Because we do everything that makes God the Father angry, and we do everything in this country that will bring his wrath on us in short order. Oh, Pastor, you're not patriotic. I'm very patriotic. I love my country dearly, but I know one thing. If we don't turn back to the God of this Bible, we are going to perish from off of this earth. I already read to you where if we sin apart from law, we will perish apart from law. We're sinning apart from law in this country, and we're going to perish apart from law in this country. People talk about it's not politically correct to say certain things. Well, you can't engage in behaviors the Bible says are an abomination. Expect it's going to work out. Oh, well, you need to preach against this one. Okay, but, but you're doing something similar. So I got people that don't want you to preach against the homosexual agenda, and then other people that are telling me that are living in fornication. Okay, Which, you can't do either one of these. Well, one Christian singer came out and, and said she was going to be a homosexual, and they said that's an abomination. She goes, so is your lunch. So here we're engaging in all of these sins all over the place, and one's accusing another. You know, you're a sinner. Oh, well, look at you. You're sinning too. That's not an excuse for any of this. All of these are reasons to turn away from sin and get, if you believe Yeshua died to pay for it. See, I'm beginning to think people don't. They're just saying it. They don't believe it. They don't believe he died to pay for it. And one reason they don't is because they don't understand he died to second death. When you understand he died to second death to take away the curse of the law from you, it's a different different day altogether. Amen? Genesis chapter 2. So the human secular, I'm sorry, stay, stay where you are. Stay here in Romans. In verse 20, 28, Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. This is what you see everywhere. Things being done that ought not be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Sounds real familiar, doesn't it? To a lot of American life. They're gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. Who of us can say we hadn't disobeyed our parents at some point in our life? We're done. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they celebrate those who do them also. And that's where we're at in America. We celebrate people who sin. It's all over the news. It's all over the networks. It's all over TV. It's all over the commercials. We celebrate those who sin. God's not mocked. He's going to bring wrath for this stuff. You know, the seculars think we're insane for believing in Yeshua Messiah. They think we're insane for clinging to our God and our guns. Well, I tell you what, Mr. Human Secularist, you cling to your sin and depravity because my Yeshua Messiah is going to rescue me from you and then God the Father is going to torture your precious Mother Earth. You know, they, they think that the global warming is why they have these fires. It's amazing how young people are anymore. I'm not saying that in a good way. You know, youth, the vigor of youth. I'm saying this in they're, they're immature. Thirty years ago, seems most people understood that you have to tend the forest. You've got to cut the fire breaks. You've got to clear the brush. You've got to get the dead wood out. That's why they did logging. You log and thin the forest so that it's a functional, sustainable forest. You don't let it grow up wild and run amok and full of weeds and brush. Then when you get lightning and or arson, then you have runaway fires. So this is not global warming. This is just called we're being stupid. They used to excoriate Ronald Wilson Reagan for a good forest management program in the Interior Department back in the 80s. Oh, you're destroying the environment. No, I'm protecting the environment. Then we had the Yellowstone Fire. How many of y'all remember the Yellowstone Fire late in, in Ronald Reagan's second term? Torched the whole park. He decided, well, since you environmentalists don't want us to manage the forest, and since forest fires are a natural occurrence, let it burn. Oh, you're not saving the forest. It's burning down. You need to send all these people. We're not going to spend any money in there saving a natural forest fire. And then the scientists went in afterwards and discovered that was natural rejuvenation of the forest. 
So you can either harvest the timber and use it and build beautiful homes and fine furniture, or you can burn the timber and recreate the forest. But you can't have both. So, you know, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, and it was a nice ad. It said, print is the ultimate green. Print is the ultimate green. See, all of you millennials, you have all of your stuff in the cloud, which requires lots of servers running lots of energy, burning lots of coal, lots of people tending it. Those of us who are old timey, we have a hard copy, and it doesn't require any energy. Once it's produced, it's done, and I have it, and it doesn't go down, and it doesn't crash, and nobody can hack it and change it. It's the ultimate green. Oh, it is recyclable. Your servers aren't. Oh, but they'll be obsolete in five years, and they'll have to be replaced. But they're not. But they're not recyclable. Oh, how about that? Paper, the ultimate green. Genesis chapter two, <coughs> verse fifteen. I, lo I love the next line. He goes, "Think broccoli. We grow trees. We harvest trees. We replant trees like a farm." And it has to be explained to people under forty that this is how the world works. Most of us already knew that. I used to work for a company called the Consolidated Tomoka Land Development Corporation. And it uh, actually has a ticker symbol that goes across there. I used to work for this company. And at one time, they had 60,000 acres of managing forest. And so they would grow slash pine trees. And if you go to Florida, you ever go to Florida, you notice their trees are in perfect rows. Up here, they're just all helter-skelter, willy-nilly. But in Florida, they're in perfect rows. It's because it's a farm. They cut the trees, they plant new trees. And so like a checkerboard, they'll take this five acres and that five acres or 10 or 20, whatever size it is, and they'll, they'll mow it. I mean, they mow the whole thing down. They don't leave anything there. And then they go back and they replant all these trees in perfect rows. But they have more trees now than they did when we got here. Because they're always growing new trees. They're all, we're always harvesting trees. Somebody get this after a while. I don't mean in here. I mean up there. Verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Here's life and death. There's two trees. One is the tree of life, and you're going to get eternal life. You're going to get the baptism of the Holy Ghost if you eat that fruit off that tree. Don't you wish it was that simple? Well, it was for Adam and Eve, but they chose the other tree. They chose to decide for themselves what is right and wrong. And they surely died. And because they made that choice, all of us have died. Because when we did that, we took death to ourselves. And so, because we're legitimate children of Adam and Eve, we've all decided for ourselves what is right and wrong. Well, I don't think that's right. No one asked you to decide that. And often we don't even look in the Torah to see. We don't even consult God. We just make up our mind. That's right. That's wrong. I don't like... We don't even look first. We just make a decision. From what? On what basis? It's our feelings. Doesn't do us very good. Genesis 3, verse 6. <clears throat> When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. See, it always makes us feel good to do it that way, right? And also desirable for gaining wisdom. Wisdom, really? Wisdom? Wisdom. Really? Do you see that in your book? Wisdom. <clears throat> she took some and ate it. And she gave some to Knucklehead. Well, he didn't tell her no. He didn't tell her no. Come on, guys. There's times when you've got to tell your wife no. And you know it's going to hurt. Oh, you know it's going to hurt. But you've been told by God that you've got to say no when this kind of stuff is going on. No. And she ain't going to like it because she already thinks it's going to make her wise. So you're telling her she can't have what she wants when she knows it's the best thing. <clears throat> Come on. We know what happens. And he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. I really don't know how they can write it that way. How can you say the eyes of both of them are opened when what they just did sewed them shut? You talk about you talk about some double speak here. I mean, you might as well have sewed them shut, because they can't see anything now. Oh, their eyes were open. They saw right and wrong. No, they didn't. They're in their own fantasy land. They ate the fruit and they went in the matrix. Instead of taking the pill to come out of the matrix, they ate the fruit to go in the matrix. 
And now they're in their own fantasy land of right and wrong. And it's not God's right, I'm wrong. It's I'm right, and what's God, what was God thinking? And this brings death on all of humanity, and it brings this way of thinking on all of humanity, and it sets us in hostility to God himself. And this is going to last a long time. <clears throat> Verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid. So this is not a good thing. Oh, yeah, man, our eyes were open. We can see clearly now. I can see clearly now the rain is... No, 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 no. We just clouded this sucker up. We just, we just went into some serious fog. We can't see anything now. Talk about a smoke screen. We are completely smoked out. So what do we do? What do we still do? Even now in the church, we decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong without consulting Torah. Romans chapter 5. Yeah, Torah was nailed to the tree. But Torah wasn't nailed to the tree. Torah is the tree of life. They call the pages on which the Torah is written leaves, and they call the two sticks on which it's rolled the branches. Torah is a tree of life because it's bringing life into you. The problem is we still read it with preconceived notions. We don't read it and just take it and accept it as it is. And even after years, you still find places where you're looking at it wrong. Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, we just read it, and death through sin. So they took it, they died, because they took it, all of us die. Because all of us followed in the steps. We already read in Romans, no one, no one, not even one has been able to bow up and say, you know what, I'm not doing it that way. I want the tree of life, I don't want that. I'm not going to decide for myself what is right and wrong. No. Bible says every mouth was silenced before his judgment. Every mouth. Zip. Got nothing to say. Death came to all. Because all sin. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. So even before Moses came down with those tablets, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there's no law. Nevertheless, everybody died. Oh. See, we read it in the beginning. All who sin apart from the law will perish. I don't want to perish. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you how bad I don't want to perish. Remember Nicolas Cage in the, in the National Treasure? I can't tell you how bad I don't want to go to jail. I can't tell you how bad I don't want to perish. I don't want to perish. It, as bad as human life can be, it's a lot more enjoyable than perishing. Oh, come on. I don't want to perish. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those over those who did not sin by breaking a commandment, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. So disobedience brought us death, and this death is the second death from the wrath of God. Matthew chapter 10. I'm, I'm not going to do a whole study on Gehenna. I'm just going to show you a couple of uses of Gehenna. Gehenna is a euphemism for the Valley of ben Hinnom which in the time of Jesus was the way Jews looked at the lake of fire. They didn't understand it's a lake of fire. They didn't understand nuclear fire. All this stuff is many, many years from coming around. But they did understand that in the valley of ben Hinnom there were continual, it was a continual trash dump, and they were always burning garbage and dead animals down in there. So they used the valley of ben Hinnom as a euphemism for the ultimate wrath of God and dying accursed. Right, John's going to explain to you the lake of fire. We'll get there in a minute, but they haven't got that yet. So there, he, but Jesus understands that, and he's telling them about this. So Matthew 10 and verse 28. <clears throat> Do not be afraid of those who can kill your body. Why? Because you're going to come up in the resurrection. Don't be afraid of the first death. You're going to die then anyway. Everybody's looking at me kind of funny. But cannot kill your spirit. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both spirit and body in Gehenna. See, you, you got a God that's going to judge this world, and he can kill you in Gehenna from which there's no return. Don't be afraid of people who put you in the resurrection. Don't be afraid of the resurrection. You have an advocate. Be afraid of Gehenna from which there's no advocate and no return. Amen? Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. Another time he uses Gehenna. <clears throat> and this is, he's using it against religious leaders. 
Amen? <clears throat> Matthew 24 and verse 33. <clears throat> These are people who make a big outward show of keeping God's law while they're breaking it all over the place. And they're putting God in a bad light in front of the people. All right, verse 33. You snakes! See, Jesus isn't nice. Oh, but pastor, he's nice. You call them snakes. You know what your Bible says? You snakes. These are the religious leaders. You brood of vipers. You know what a viper is, right? Like a rattlesnake or a moccasin. How will you escape being condemned to Gehenna? With the way you're teaching people, with the way you're living, with the way you are a hypocrite, how will you escape the lake of fire? Wow, that's heavy. That's really harsh. That's not nice. The more to the point is that without Yeshua Messiah, no human being has eternal life. No human being has eternal life. You don't have it. You're not born with an immortal soul. That's the Greek thinking of Plato. That's the pagans. The pagans say your soul is immortal. Who told you that lie? We, we read it. We read it in Genesis 3. The devil told that lie. That's the devil's lie. Your eyes are going to be opened and you're not going to die. Okay. All right. Maybe you could understand Adam and Eve believing that lie. But down here 6,000 years later, how do you believe the lie? How do you believe the lie after 6,000 years of all your peeps dying? How many funerals you got to go to before you figure it out? How many funerals you got to go to? How many times you got to weep and cry for your loved ones before you figure out that the devil was a liar? He said you're not going to die. God said you are going to die. Who, who told you the truth? God told you you're going to die. You don't have an immortal soul. You're going to die. You got a problem because you like to live. And, and you made the problem worse because you broke the Torah. And you want to live, and you can't live when you break Torah. Because he said you've got to die. We have a problem. But we can fix this problem. This is a solvable problem. Amen? Now, let's go to Revelation. We're going to talk about the second death. Revelation, chapter 20. Second death. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. Okay. Now, note to self. Self, I want to be in the first resurrection. Right? Self, I want to be in the first resurrection. Why do you want to be in the first resurrection? Because the second death has no power over you. You want to be the second death. Amen? Y'all look at me funny. I hear I'd be nod. I ought to, I ought to have a house full of nods. Press hard. Five copies. Sign, you know. Sign me up now. Right? Well, a couple of them got it. First resurrection has two parts. The first part is the rescue of the saints. This one's a little more money, but if you go to Hungry Hearts MIN at AOL.com, I mean, uh, Hungry Hearts Ministry.com, you can buy this. I think it's $14. That includes sales tax and shipping. Great book teaches you how to make the first resurrection, the rescue, first part of the first resurrection. Amen. Why do you want to do that? Because you get your change on the way up. Oh, come on. Get your change on the way up. All right. Now, second death, go to verse 14. Chapter 20, verse 14. This is the great white throne judgment. Right? Everybody who's not in the first resurrection is going to come up in the second resurrection, and they're going to be judged. And, of course, they're guilty. Right? Everybody's guilty. We already read that. No one, not even one. We're all guilty. So, verse 14. Then death in the grave, because that's what Hades means, the grave. Death in the grave, or thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hmm. You need to make sure your name is in the Lamb's book of life, right? There's no higher priority, is there? It's the only priority. There is no other priority. I don't need to eat, but i got to be in the, in the book of life. Because if I die the first death, it's no big deal. It's the second death that gets you. Oh, come on. All right, chapter 21, verse 7. Now, this is God the Father speaking. Right? I'm actually going to come up a little bit. <clears throat> verse 5. He who was seated on the throne said, This is, this is the Father. 
You notice these are not red letter words, right? Because your Bible is red letters when it's Yeshua talking. These are not red letters. It should be gold letters, amen? It ought to be gold embossed right here because this is the Father talking to you, right? I'm making everything new. He said, he's making everything new. Then he said, write this down. Write this down. So you should write this down, right? So he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Look what he says to write. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him is thirsty and will give the right to drink from the spring of water of life. It means you can never die. He who overcomes will inherit all this. He who overcomes. We talked about overcoming last time, right? It's not the delivered. It's the overcomers, right? And I will be his God and he will be my child. So you want to be a child of God, you've got to overcome. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which is the second death. Wow. Okay, well, when the Father says it, there's no getting out of that. That's just done. D-U-N. Game over. O-B. Done. If the Father says this is what's going to happen, there's no way you or Yeshua or anybody's going to cross that. The Father's not the angry God of the Old Testament that Yeshua came and overturned everything. That's not how it happened. When he speaks, over. O-V. Done. Okay. We live once. We do what we do. We die. We come up for judgment. And we receive in ourselves what we are due from God. Colossians chapter 2. Do this every year before Passover. We're going to do it again this year before Passover. you got to understand this. This is very important. <coughs> <coughs> Verse 14, having canceled the written code. The word written code does not mean written code. The Greek is choreographon dogma. It means an invoice, a term of indebtedness, a bond. You wrote a bond in your own handwriting. That's why it's sometimes called the handwriting of ordinances. Right? It's, it's a complicated term that means a lot of things, and everybody translates it different, but they only catch a piece of it. So you are writing out a surety bond to God the Father. You owe me death in the lake of fire because, and then all the things you did. I did this, five-finger discount. I told this lie. I, I did this. I did that. I, I mocked and laughed here. I said some gossip. Whatever it is. The whole list is in your handwriting, written in your blood, and the bill due to you is death in the lake of fire. The father is not late paying his bills. I know some of us kind of put the bills off. We don't want to pay them, so we pay them late and kind of get around to it, whatever. He don't do that. He owes you death in the lake of fire? <laughs> Paid. Done, just like that. Uh, Colossians 2 and verse 14. So... If he owes you a land grant in the kingdom, paid. So now, you can hold these if you want to pay the freight. You can keep your invoice due. God the Father will pay you. Or you can nail him to the cross. So that's the rest of the verse, right? Having canceled the written code with his regulations, it was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. So do you have to burn a sin list? No, you can keep them. You can keep them if you want them. But you're going to get paid. You're going to get paid. And that payment is death in the lake of fire. <coughs> paid. Boom. Father's not going to be late. You'd be amazed how quick that bill gets paid. So our bills, you know, you put them in there, and the post office sends them to Memphis, and sometimes it takes three weeks for them to get where they're going. That ain't how God pays his bills. Boom, instant, paid, done, D-U-N, done. We're in the South, D-U-N, done. Likewise, if you're building reward and you're nailing your sins to the cross by confessing them to Yeshua Messiah and getting rid of them, he's going to pay you your reward in the kingdom just as quickly. Right? I mean, to me, it's a no-brainer. <clears throat> Romans chapter 2 and verse 5. To me, it's a no-brainer. I, I don't even see why there's even ever an argument unless you just don't know the Bible. But after you get into some Bible, it's like, how do you argue with this, man? This is as good as it gets. So I can confess my sins to Yeshua, and he'll take them away and nail them to the cross. I mean, I don't know how much better life can get than that. I mean, to me, that's like, man, whoo, thank you, Jesus, man. I'm in love. I'm in love. I'm in love. 
Yeah, he's right, I'm wrong. Yeah, I can say it real quick. He's right, I'm wrong. He's right, I am wrong. He is always right. He is brilliant, magnificent, perfect, right, righteous, and I'm I'm just thank you, Jesus. He even even talked to me, right? I mean, I'll never forget we had one lady who used to work for us and and every time we come up, her kids would come out and talk to us. And as soon as she got in the van, she'd go, why do you talk to them? <laughs> why he talks to me, I'm just grateful and thankful, right? Because I'm just a knucklehead. I'm just so glad and so grateful that I even get to talk, find, read, study, anything. It's just, hey, hey, I'm just happy, right? I'm just happy. He's right, and I'm, I'm just happy. <clears throat> Verse 5. <clears throat> and wrong. Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So don't be unrepentant. Unrepentant stores up wrath. Don't, be, don't do that. God will give to each person according to what he's done. Don't think you're going to be missed. He's not going to miss you. Oh, he's not going to see me. I'm just me down here. I'm so very ordinary. I'll never. Oh, no, he knows right where you are. He knows right where you are. He got your address, man, on a speed dial. Don't ever think. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he's going to give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Okay, you got a choice. The problem is we've done some of both. And we've got to get rid of this negative side, right? There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. Man, see, that's a bad verse. Isn't that a bad verse? It's a good verse, but the problem is it's not really working in our favor, is it? First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and shalom for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Oh, we need some of that, though, don't we? Wow. Wow. See, most of the revelations given to me during Sukkot have to do with arranging our lives and our focus for how to earn reward. How to set things up so we can present before him in a way to get a reward. In a way to spend our life building reward by serving in his kingdom. Amen. How to better remove sin and better build reward for the day of judgment. Revelation 5 and verse 6. I'm not going to read all of it here because I am <clears throat> running, running a little behind. Revelation 5 and verse 6. You have here, worthy is the lamb who died in our place. Right? So if you look at Revelation 5, starting in verse 6, I saw a lamb look as if he'd been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of the Father who sits on the throne. When he'd taken it, they all fell down. They began to worship and pray. Look at the song. You're worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men from every tribe and family and language and nation. And you made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And again, they say it in the next, the next stanza. You died and were slain. He died and was slain to take care of us. Now flip back to Revelation 1 in verse 18. I want you to see this. It's in red letters. Amen. It's in red letters. Jesus talking. I am the living one. I was dead, and now I am alive. So he was killed with the second death to pay for you and I, and now he is alive. This is a very important part. We're going to go to Romans, and we're going to let Paul explain to you the gravity of this. Behold, I am alive forever and ever and ever, and he holds the keys to death and the grave. So if he locks you in, you ain't getting out. If he opens the door and lets you out of there, you can't be put back in. Come on, this is, this is getting good, right? <clears throat> I'm not going to go back to Hebrews chapter 2, because we already read that about how... No, we didn't even read Hebrews 2. How did I miss Hebrews 2? Hebrews 2. I can't believe I skipped that. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in our humanity. He too shared in our humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who owes the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. All of our lives we've been in fear of the wrath of God and the punishment that comes from it, but he shared in our humanity so he could take it away. He paid the price. He paid your invoice due from the Father. What a tragedy it would be. 
that Yeshua Messiah has paid your price, but you keep holding on to it. No, I'll pay it. No, I'll pay it. No, it's all right. Why should he pay it and you pay it? He paid it already. Let him have the bill. Don't fuss. Just let him have the bill. Amen? Romans chapter 5. Let's compare and contrast this. He's frees you from the fear of the second death, provided you stay repentant. Or sin in the world is unrepentant sin. Romans 5, verse 15. The gift is not like the trespass. Right? Adam trespassed. The gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that comes by that grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So whereby he trespassed and we all are in, how much more then when Jesus gives the gift? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brings justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigns through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life of the one man, Jesus Christ? So Adam put us under the bus. Jesus puts us in the seat. Passenger seat, baby. With all the accoutrements. Nice cold breeze. Screen, movies, books. Right? You go from under the bus to riding in the bus. Amen? <clears throat> Consequently, just as the result of one trash was, trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For as just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man many will be made righteous. You can avail yourself of that sacrifice Remove yourself from the trespass of Adam and put yourself into the justification and righteousness of Yeshua Messiah. He died for everyone and everything. His resurrection brings life to all. After we accept slash believe in his sacrifice, where many miss it is we take his sacrifice, then we, we are accountable to him for our sin. And people say that once they're saved, they're not accountable for sin anymore. But you're still accountable for sin. I like the way Coleman put it. Grace is get right and correct errors. It's a continual process of getting right and correcting errors. Amen? You start with getting rid of the sins of these. You stop doing the five-finger discount. But then you've got to roll up into the stinking thinking. Then you've got to get down into the conflicts. Everybody has inner conflicts. Why? Because the devil made sure you got them. He spent a lot of your childhood jacking you up, making sure you got inner conflicts. Some of us are a little worse than others. And so you've got to resolve those conflicts. And it takes some time. Praise God we get a lifetime. Amen? Praise God, he doesn't just demand it right this second, like he's flipping a toggle switch. Romans chapter 6 and verse 2. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You were baptized into his death. You already taken your death. You already taken your, it is appointed a man once to die. You're on, your, you're on your next life now. You're already supposed to be being renewed with him in that resurrection. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We're supposed to be in that new life. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we'll certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with so that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died is freed from sin. So when you get water baptized, you died, you're freed from sin. Now you can live for righteousness. Oh, but the old man comes back all so quick, doesn't he? Doesn't he come back so quick? It's almost like it never happens sometimes, right? So now living to contrary to Torah is no longer an option. Grace, then, is the protection you need while you learn how. Look, when I first started keeping the Sabbath, I was overly zealous. How many of y'all have ever had some overly zealous Sabbath keeping? Then, because you're overly zealous, you overcorrect by being too lenient. Anything goes. How many of y'all did that? Anything goes. So then you kind of bounce back and forth like a, like a ping pong table. Boom, 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 boom. Until you finally settle on into some balance. Not too strict. Not too lenient. Just keeping the Sabbath. 
That's what grace is for. We do this with every one of our sins. We get too zealous, we get too lenient, we get too zealous, we get too lenient. We bounce back and forth until we can finally settle in to a good balance where the spirit in us is comfortable keeping the laws, keeping the commandments. We've got it in balance. Well, we need grace while that's going on. Because in the Old Testament, you'd have been stoned. Praise God for grace. Amen. <laughs> I mean, praise God for some grace. Verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Therefore, do not let sin rule in your body so that you obey its desires. Does that sound like the law's done away? Do not offer your part, the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. Don't offer the parts of your body to break God's law. Does that sound like the law's done away? As those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to Yeshua, him, as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but you're under grace. Does that sound like the law's done away with? No, it doesn't. Living by Torah is easy. Actually, living by Torah is easier than living not by Torah. It's a lot easier to keep this than to not keep this. Maybe it's because I'm saved. Nonetheless, it's easier. Easier, in fact, than breaking Torah. Hebrews. Oh, we just did Hebrews. I'm not going to do it again. Yeshua Messiah freed us from the fear of the second death. He frees us from the power of the devil. Because he died on a tree, the cross, as the curse of the law, our acceptance of that sacrifice frees us from the curse of the law. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. You've been freed from the curse. You've been freed from the curse. Can you feel the weight lift off your shoulders after you got baptized? Everything's great. Verse 20. <clears throat> Yeshua has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who die. I'm, not, I'm dispensing with the euphemism falling asleep. I, I saw that in there. For since death came through a man, Adam, the resurrection comes also through a man, Yeshua. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. There's an order to this. Everybody didn't come up at the same time. Everybody's not saved today. Some people are saved today. Some people are going to get saved in the kingdom. Some people are going to get saved in the, in, the, in the great white throne judgment. So you can't get upset with them when they, they can't see the truth. But you see it now. Oh, see, that's the problem. You see it now. This is your day of salvation. You don't get another one. Amen? Each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits. Then those who belong to him when he comes, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to the Father after he's destroyed all dominion and power and authority. For he must reign until he has put his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. He's going to destroy death. He's going to destroy death. When the last humans either converted or in the lake of fire, he will destroy death. There will be no more death. You know, when we came under the curse of the law, the devil thought he had this in the bag. Oh, yeah, man, they, 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 they broke the law, man. They're under the curse. It's over, man. It's over. I got it. All I got to do is hang out and hold on, buddy. Is It's over. And then Yeshua dies on the cross, and you can almost hear the panic when he says, um, um, if, if you're the son of man, would you come, come, on, come, 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 on, come on down off that cross. Up there. Oh, my goodness. If he dies up there, it's over. Oh, my goodness. And then, he, and then what does he say when he dies? It's finished. <laughs> you lose. <laughs> I win. Game over. You thought you thought it was over. I just had you. you just, I sucker Jen. You didn't know it coming. You never saw it coming. I died up on the cross, and the devil loses. It's over. Game over. Game over. You can go home now. It's over. <laughs> and yet, we watch the movie, and we all mourn when we see him die, because we should know that was supposed to have been our death. But it was his. But it is a permanent victory. And the devil can't recover. It really, if the devil had any sense, he would just go ahead and surrender to Michael right now. He would just surrender. They'd all come out, lay their weapons down, put their hands out to be cuffed. They'd just surrender. You put your hands behind your back. they do it differently. You lace your fingers up here. I mean, they would just go ahead and take the cuffing and be over with, right? Just be incarcerated now and save themselves all the hassle and harassment. They're not that smart. <clears throat> Verse 42. So it will be in the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown, 
Your life now is perishable. The body that is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. So if there is a natural body, and you're in it, right? You're right? Anybody got arthritis? You hurt? It's a natural body, right? Yeah, amen? If it's a natural body, then there is a spiritual body. Come on, it's just one of those you can't lose things, right? So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that was the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those of the earth. As is the man from heaven, so are also are those from heaven. Just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. That's big stuff. Talk about rescued from a body of death. See, because Yeshua died the second death, he was raised to the second life. Likewise, we who have taken the Yeshua will likewise be counted as having taken the, second, the first death so that we can be raised. I'm sorry, we're counted as having taken the second death so we can be raised to the second life. Right? That's the purpose of his sacrifice, is that the second death is applied to you, therefore you're raised with his new life. There is no more death for you. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This is what turned the whole world upside down, guys. This little understanding I'm giving you right now turned the whole world upside down because these people did not care what happened to them anymore. They were martyred in unspeakable torture. They didn't care. You can kill this. I don't care. I've already beaten the second death. You got no power. Over <clears throat> Romans six and verse eight. <clears throat> now, if we die with Christ, we believe we'll also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. He cannot die again. There's no more death for Yeshua. For, for we, Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives for God. Once included in Christ, breaking God's law should never even enter into our minds. Hold your place here and flip over a couple pages to chapter 8 and verse 5. Because we're coming right back to chapter 6. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Okay, if you live by sinning, your mind stays on sinning. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Right? So if you're in the Spirit, you stay in the Spirit, you think in the Spirit. The mind of the sinful man is death. So if you keep your mind set on sin, it's called death. Except in this case for you, it's second death, right? Because once the sacrifice is no good anymore, it all comes back. But the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Now watch. Look at verse 7. Very important. The sinful mind is hostile to God. So you're dealing with somebody that's hostile to God. This is what you're looking at. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So when you've got somebody that won't submit to God's law, they're telling you. Lisa's always, the prophet Nisa is always talking about this. The devil's got to tell you who they are. Oh, yeah, man. My specialty is lust. So whoever's got a demon that's specialty is lust, they've got to tell you what they're up. They've got to tell you their game. Well, I'm hostile to God's law. Yeah. That's who I am. I'm hostile to God's law. Well, Nisa, she, she points this out to me all the time. Anytime we get in an environment and this kind of stuff breaks out, we get in the car. See, I told you. I told you. They always got to tell me who they are. They always, and sometimes it's unprovoked. They just walk up and tell her. She's a prophet. It's like they got a report. Okay, okay, I, I'm, the, I'm the hostile to God's law demon. I just got a report, prophet niece. Or, oh yeah, I got a lust problem, prophet niece. And whatever, whatever the demon is, whatever it does, he's got to go up to prophet niece and report himself. This is who I am. Yes, reporting. Yes. It's every time and anywhere we go. So if you're dealing with somebody and they're hostile to God's law, they're just telling you what's going on. Sinful mind. Sinful mind. I'm not saved. A sinful mind is not saved. Someone who's hostile to God's law is not saved. I'd like to be nice and tell you it's true, different, but that's the way it is. If they still are hostile, they're not saved. 
They need to be led to Christ. Because once you've accepted him and you've died with him, when you raise up, you can't be subject to sin. Back to chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're under law? Not under law, but under grace. A lot of different words used. It's just very, very, very strong language. We'll just go with absolutely not. Okay? That's not what's in the NIV. We'll, just, we'll use absolutely not. Because it's a lot stronger than what's in any of our Bibles. Because he, he throws down pretty hard right here. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slaves to the one you obey? Whether you're slaves to sin, which leads to death, or a slave to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, which way you want to go? If you sin, you're a slave to sin, you're going to die. If, you're a sla if you obey, you're a slave to righteousness, you're going to live. I don't know which way you want to go. It gets back to that perish thing, right? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to what? Righteousness. That means you're obeying. We already read that it, you know, no one will be declared righteous by Torah. I put this in human terms because you're weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body to slavery in impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, which is living by the rules in the Bible because of your faith in Yeshua. It's got to be because of your faith in Yeshua. That's what makes it righteous. If you're doing it because you believe in Yeshua, then you're being righteous. Amen? When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. So when you're out there running amok, you didn't care. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? What benefit did you get? Got sick a lot, right? Had all kinds of personal problems. Stack them up like cordwood, right? <clears throat> Those things result in death. So you go out, you run amok, and all those things result in death. Well, who wants to die? But now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is what? Eternal life. So you don't have eternal life in you. Jesus gives you eternal life. Next verse. For the wages of sin is what? Not living in hell. Death. But the gift of God is eternal life. So you can get this gift. He'll give you this gift. You get this gift when you accept Him and you take Him in and you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you start living differently and you throw off the constraints of sin and start taking the constraints of righteousness. And people want to tell you to get rid of the constraints of righteousness. That's nonsense. Chapter 8 and verse 9. When the CD's done, the CD's done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish it up. Verse 9. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. All right? So, but he already told you that you can't have the Spirit of God if you're still hostile to God's law. So which is it? Either you're controlled by the Spirit and you love God's law, because that's the way the mind of Christ is, or you're controlled by the sinful nature, which is hostile to God's law. You can't have it both ways. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin. All right, you sinned in this body. You, ain't nothing you can do for it. There ain't no help for it. Hey, you, you want a new model anyway, right? Really, you want a new model? I mean, rebuilding the engine ain't going to get it done, is it? Well, I got too many things. My suspension is all messed up. I need a lot of parts. All the bushings are gone. Shocks, are gone. shocks, shocks the struts, man. Boom. I mean, you feel it. Look here. We need a new body, right? You send in this one. Ain't nothing you can do for it. You send in it. But, but watch the rest of this. <clears throat> Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. So what if your body dies? Your spirit can't die. Why? Because it's irrevocably joined with Yeshua Messiah, and he can't die. So if he can't die, how can you die? Oh, this is good stuff right here now. <clears throat> If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your body through the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, we have an obligation. See, we don't like obligations in America. We don't, don't kill the, record, I mean the, the video. We don't like obligations in America. We want to do whatever we want to do, whenever we want to do it, 
however we want to do it. But he's telling you that he's going to give you life and you have an obligation. It's not to be a sinner. I know it's not worded that way, but that's what it means. Not to the sinful nature. It's not to be a sinner, to live according to, to the sinful nature. That's being a sinner, right? For if you live according to the sinful nature, you are going to... doesn't say live in hell. It says die, doesn't it? D, I, you know, in the South we call that day ed. Day ed. You're not just going to die. You're going to be day ed. <clears throat> but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. I don't know about you, but I want to live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of the God are children of God. So what do you want? I don't know about you, but I want to live. For the unconverted, this death is the first death to wait the resurrection and given a chance to live this way of life. For the converted, if we refuse him who speaks, we will die the second death. <clears throat> Living by the Spirit does not include willful and wanted breaking of God's laws. And I've had people tell me that. Pentecostals tell me that they have to break the Sabbath, eat unclean animals, because that is what they got to do to be saved. I've, I've, I've been told that before. That's not going to get it done. Willful and one and breaking of God's laws is not going to get you in the kingdom. This will get you in the wrath of God. I am going to go to Matthew 5 this time. Matthew 5, verse 19. Uh, Yeshua is very, very uh, emphatic on this point right here. And since we're filming, I, I want this on, the, on the, the YouTube. Matthew 5 and verse 19. For those of you in YouTube, land, if you're still with me on this, you've done really well. <clears throat> I want you to understand the importance of living a spirit-filled life by keeping Torah. It's very important. Most people who teach Torah do not teach it on this level. And I want you to understand that you can always get it straight and true here. And this verse is going to tell you why that you can always get it straight and true here. So Matthew 5 and verse 19. <clears throat> Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments. Oh, wow. The least. And teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of God. Wow. That's just red letters here, man. This is the red letter stuff. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of God. Mark Bill Schultz down as one who teaches and practices these commandments. You just mark that down. Schultz is going to teach this stuff to the very end. Got a great uh, CD from Mercy Me called Lifer. Long as I'm breathing... I'm going to be preaching for you. They, they say singing, but I mean they're singers, right? So I, I was singing this song in the car when I had the volume on 20. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm singing it. As long as I'm breathing, I'm going to keep preaching for you. Amen? And I'm going to keep preaching that every one of these commandments has to be kept because I want to be great in the kingdom of God. I don't want to be least in the kingdom of God. I want nothing to do with least in my name in it. Amen? Come on, you want to be least in the kingdom of God? What have you done all this for? To be least? Walk around, I get, to, I get to just pan and get the trash off the... No, please, no. We've done this all my life. I don't want to do this in the kingdom of God. Are you kidding? Hmm. Hebrews chapter 10. <clears throat> I'm going to read a pretty hard passage of Scripture. Because, you know, Jesus died a pretty hard death. He took the curse of the law. He took it in the beating. He took it in the scourging. He took it in the agony. He took it on the cross. He took a hard death. He took a very hard death. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter 4, it says that the man who has suffered in his body is done with sin. So Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. <clears throat> if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Now, this is not the stuff on your sin list. This is walking away from the truth and going back to live like the heathen. Ancient Roman celebrations in modern Christianity is living like the heathen. I'm sorry to tell you that, but it is. Actually, I'm happy to tell you that. I'm hoping you'll pay attention and, and take it up. Stuff on your sin list while you're struggling to obey is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about when you walk away and say, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to try to serve God anymore. I'm not going to try to keep his commandments anymore. I'm going to go out and live like the heathen. I just don't care. Pastor Bill's a nut. 
and we're just walking away. That's what he's talking about. No sacrifice of sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses, you see this, right? Is this what it says, law of Moses, right? You see it right there. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for grace. Thank you, Jesus, for grace. Because any of the stuff on our sin list would have been game over if, if there had been two or three witnesses. You wouldn't have had a chance to repent. Amen? Game over. Get the stones out. Instead, we get to come to Jesus, confess our sins, and receive forgiveness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a person deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? Don't walk away from this. You can't lose if you don't quit. Do you realize that? He already got you in the he already got you in the second life. You can't lose if you don't quit. So guess what? Don't quit. Fail to take the action. When it comes to walking away from the truth, become the biggest and slowest procrastinator of all time. If you can't take it anymore, just say you'll quit tomorrow because you know it's always today. It's always today. For we know him who said it's mine to avenge. I will repay, and again, the Lord is a, will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeshua Messiah suffered the second death. He is not going to take any excuses from us. I want to thank you for watching this message. I hope it encourages you to have a closer walk with Yeshua Messiah and a stronger love of the Holy Bible. If you're interested in more information, you can go to HungryHeartsMinistry.com, and we have many free materials available. Sample copy of the magazine. You can get the magazine for suit by simply emailing me at uh, hungryhearts at min at aol.com or you can contact me through the website and we'll get this to you free of charge. Thank you for watching. Hope to see you again next time. Miss Sandy's on deck next week. Thank you.